world. Let's pray together. Father, we love you and we honor you. Pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to your truth. Pray that a divine deposit would be made in every heart. Ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. The conference in New York, I was asked to focus on one specific subject. The future of the land of Israel and the people of Israel according to traditional Jewish thinking. What did the Jewish rabbis have to say about this? Now, we'll be looking at a lot of scripture as we go, but I also want to give you background into Jewish ways of thinking. And, and there's a key point that I want you to take away with you. The people of Israel and the land of Israel are totally related. From a biblical and Jewish viewpoint, it is impossible to have a blessed future for the people without them being united with the land. This is written in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Sheet bara Elohim et shemayim ve'et ha'aretz. We read that, and we don't think about the land of Israel in particular. We read Genesis 1, and we don't ask, why does the Bible start there? Seems logical. For a traditional Jewish person, it's not so logical. For a traditional Jew, what's the purpose of the Torah? The purpose of the Torah is to give the divine commandments, to show the Jewish people how to live. Why start with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth? This is what the most famous Jewish commentary on the Bible starts with. It was written almost a thousand years ago. And he asked this question. Why does the Torah start with this? Why not start with Exodus 12? That's where God gives the commandments of Passover. That's where the legal section of the Torah begins. Why not start there? Is the answer. The nations of the world, specifically the Canaanite nations, they will say to Israel, this is not your land. You are robbers. You're trying to steal it. This is a thousand years ago. It's the very same thing we hear today. You don't have a right to this land. You are stealing it from the Palestinians. So this is what this Jewish commentary says a thousand years ago. The reason that we start with Genesis 1-1 is simple. God is saying to the world, I'm the one that created everything. The whole world belongs to me. I gave it to you Canaanite nations, and now I took it from you and gave it to the people of Israel. There are traditional Jewish teachings that say this. Who will inherit the world to come? Well, someone who teaches his children to obey God's commandments will inherit the world to come. They also say this. Whoever lives in the land of Israel will inherit the world to come. There's even an ancient Jewish tradition that says when the flood came, Noah's flood, it didn't touch the land of Israel. Of course, these are just Jewish tradition. One of them suggests there was an invisible wall that kept the flood from touching Israel. Really, Scripture is clear that what we call the land of Israel today was certainly flooded back then. But the point is simple. There is this belief that the land itself is special in many ways. But what about the future? What about the end times? What about the study of Jewish eschatology? If I talk to different churches about the end times, they have many different opinions. All of these different theologies focus on the end times. When I'm doing my radio show, if I want to have a lively debate with my listeners, I talk about the end times. Everyone has a viewpoint and an opinion. I got saved in 1971. I was a heavy drug user. I was playing drums in a rock band. I had long hair. My wife, Nancy, is also Jewish. She used to be an atheist. I got saved at 16, she got saved at 19, and she saw a picture of me with my long hair. She started laughing. I said, you're laughing because I look like a woman. She said, no, I'm laughing because you look like an ugly woman. I got saved in 1971. Everyone was talking about it. Jesus is coming any minute. Jesus is coming soon. The end time, signs are here. Bible prophecy is being fulfilled. One time we had changed the clocks when we push them forward or push them backward every year. And I had my times wrong, and I came to the church building and no one was there. I thought, oh no, Jesus must have come back and somehow I missed it. So Christians think about the end times a lot. You don't have a lot of that in the traditional Jewish literature. 
The main emphasis is on observing the Torah, being the commandments of God on a daily basis in this world. That's the emphasis. I was doing some research on the topic. I have a big encyclopedia of early Judaism. I took out the book and opened up to eschatology, study of the end times. And it had very little to say about traditional Jewish teaching about the end times. Now there is a famous ancient Jewish tradition that says this. The world will exist for 6,000 years. This is now the Jewish year 5,774. This tradition says the world will exist for 6,000 years. 2,000 years of chaos, 2,000 years of Torah, and 2,000 years of the Messiah. The period of chaos is from Adam to Abraham. Why Abraham? Why not Moses? Jewish tradition believes that God revealed the Torah in full to Abraham. Jewish tradition believes that on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses the written law and an oral explanation. And in Genesis 26, it says that, God, that Abraham observed God's laws, plural. Genesis 26, 5. So what does Jewish tradition deduce from this? that both the written law and the oral law were revealed to Abraham. And it is reading something into the text that is not there, flex the Jewish belief that Abraham already had the law revealed to him. So 2,000 years of chaos from Adam to Abraham, and then 2,000 years of Torah from Abraham to the Messiah, and then 2,000 years of the Messiah. That means, according to the rabbinic chronology, the Messiah should have come almost 1,800 years ago. There's actually an error in the rabbinic chronology, and you could argue that according to the expectation, the Messiah should have come almost 2,000 years ago. What's the traditional Jewish explanation? What happened? What went wrong? Well, they say the Messiah was supposed to come many centuries ago, but because of our sins, he didn't. I said, no, of course not. He came exactly when he was supposed to come, but because of our sins, we missed it. But the Jewish tradition does not say a lot about the end times. On the other hand, there are many passages in the Hebrew Scriptures that prophesy about the Messianic age, and these are things we look forward to when Jesus returns. You know, there's a Jewish joke and it's part of a dispute with Christians. We are praying for the Messiah to return. You say Jesus was not the Messiah, we're praying for the Messiah to come. And we've challenged them. As a Jew debating my own people, I've challenged them. How do you know that the one to come is not the one that already came? So there's a Jewish joke. When the Messiah comes, this is the first question we'll ask him. Is this your first time here or were you here before? So many of the things that we are looking forward to when Jesus returns, Jews are praying for with the coming of the Messiah. Let's understand this. Jews are not thinking about floating on the clouds of heaven. Many times that's the Christian image. We will die and forever and ever we will float on the clouds of heaven and we will play harps. You have these pictures of these chubby little people, and they're playing harps, they're smiling, floating on the clouds, and that's what we'll do forever. Number one, I don't see that in scripture. Number two, it doesn't really appeal to me. And I have friends who have been tortured for their faith and even martyred for their faith. I can assure you they were not doing it to float on clouds of heaven playing harps. Yes, we will be with the Lord forever. And that's what we look forward to above all. But the great promises of Scripture is that the kingdom of God will be fully manifest on the earth. The church often prays prayers and doesn't even think about what it's praying. It is very customary in Korean churches to pray the Lord's Prayer. And what are we praying? We're praying for the hallowing of God's name. We're praying, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come where? Your kingdom come here, to earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that will only fully happen when Jesus returns and establishes his kingdom here on earth. So the Jewish hope for the future is tied in with God's kingdom coming to this world. There is an expectation of the final resurrection. There is an expectation of an eternal age. But the greatest expectation is to see God's messianic kingdom manifest on the earth. Where we can put together 
a picture of the future according to traditional Jewish sources, we can make a list of what to expect. There will be final shaking on the earth. This is according to traditional Jewish expectation, according to the ancient rabbis. There will be a time of shaking and even apostasy in the world. Elijah will come as the forerunner of the Messiah. The Messiah will not come from heaven, but will be revealed as someone here on the earth. And then there will be the final battle against worldly powers. The Messiah will destroy these worldly powers. He will destroy the enemies of Israel. And the exiles will be regathered. And God's kingdom will be centered in the Holy Land. And through that, renewal will come to the world. And then the final resurrection. So let's step back for a moment and consider what Scripture says about the land of Israel. And then after that, we will consider some of the Jewish expectations that tie in with that. According to Jeremiah 16, 18, God refers to Israel as my land and my inheritance. 내가 우선 그들의 악과 죄를 배나 갚을 것은 어, 그들이 그 미운 물건의 시체로 내 땅을 더럽히며 그들의 가정한 것으로 내 산업에 가득하게 하였음이니라. So God is saying about Israel, this is my place. And then God says, I'll give it to you. But if you sin against the land, you're sinning against me. God promised this land unconditionally to the patriarchs. Let's look in Psalm 105, verses 8 through 11. And let's understand something. When God made this covenant with Abram in the beginning, it was an unconditional promise. There was an ancient Near Eastern way of making a covenantal treaty. You would take animals and you would kill them. And then you would cut them in half. So this was a terribly bloody spectacle. And then you'd put half of the animals here and half of the animals here. And if the two of us were kings... We were making a covenant, swear on oath to each other. And we would swear to the gods. And we would walk through those pieces together. This is actually mentioned in Jeremiah 34, by the way. It speaks of the covenant of passing through the pieces. And this is what you would swear to the God. May the gods make me and my people like both parties would pass through the pieces. But in Genesis 15, God puts Abram to sleep. And then God himself passes through the pieces. It's a powerful image. It is an unconditional covenant. God is saying, this is my promise and oath to you. Psalm 105, verses 8 through 11. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. Now, several hundred years later, he gave the law. And in the law, he said, if you obey, I will bless you and keep you in the land. But if you disobey, I will scatter you from the land. And if you repent, I will bring you back. But Paul explains this in Galatians 4. The law cannot annul the promise. In other words, God still promised the land to the people. And because he is God, he can bring his people back whenever he wants. And that's why, for example, in Ezekiel 36, God says, I'm bringing you back for my sake. I'm not bringing you back because you're holy. I'm bringing you back because I'm holy and I'm getting a bad reputation because of you. This is God's prerogative and it is his promise. So, Israel was God's own inheritance as a physical land, and then he gave it to the people of Israel as their special possession. If they sinned against the physical land, they would go into exile. What do I mean? Well, Israel was commanded to keep a Sabbath every seventh year. You must let the land rest. Second Chronicles 36 tells us this. The children of Israel went into exile because they failed to let the land rest. So it would rest for 70 years to make up for all the time when it didn't rest. 35 tells us this about murder. Bloodshed pollutes the land. There's actually something polluting that happens. Leviticus 18 teaches us this. There are certain sexual sins that defile the land. If Israel commits those sins, the land will vomit them out. You must see this special connection between the people and the land. And to be exiled from the land was spiritual death. Psalm 137 
Listen to what the exiles say. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our lyres, for there our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? You see, we as followers of Jesus are used to the concept of being pilgrims and strangers. We are in this world and we are not of it. We are only passing through. The image of Jewish people being pilgrims and strangers from the land is very negative. And so restoration from the land was divine favor. Restoration to the land was divine favor. It was more than just going back home. Many years ago, during the crisis in Vietnam, we opened up our doors in our church to take in refugees. It was the late 1970s and the early 1980s. People had to flee when the country collapsed. So we took these Vietnamese into our homes and they lived with us for years. And some of them used to talk about wanting to go back and fight against the enemies. That was their homeland, but they've been here for a generation. Kids are growing up in America and very few want to go back home. Uh, but there's something deeper with the Jewish people and the land of Israel. When the Passover is celebrated, you always say, next year in Jerusalem. The modern state of Israel is not called the country of Israel, but the state of Israel. This is the country of America and the state of New Jersey. But Israel is called the state of Israel. There are different reasons for it. But one is this, we are not all here. If we are all here, it will be the country of Israel. Restoration to the land would mean life and favor. So I am going to read Psalm 126, and I'll read the first three verses, and my translator will brilliantly translate them from Hebrew into Korean. Shir hamalot b'shuv Adonai shivat Sion hayinu kacholim ajimale sechok pinu it was not just a matter of being back home. It was a matter of being back in the favor of God. Most Israelis are not religious. 75% are fairly secular. And the Jews who are most religious reject Jesus the most. And yet when you're there, you realize there is a history here. There is something special spiritual here. And the end of the world will unfold right here. So again, the future messianic prophecies are tied in with the land of Israel. I want to repeat this. This is according to the Bible as well as Jewish tradition. There is no promise of a blessed future for the people of Israel outside of the land of Israel. The spiritual regathering and the physical regathering are tied in hand in hand. There are some Christian theologians who terribly misunderstand this. They will take verses from Hebrews 11. It tells us there that, that Abraham was, was looking for another city. He was looking for the city whose builder and maker was God. He and the patriarchs just lived in tents. They didn't really care that much about the physical land. We find that in Hebrews 11 verse 10 and verse 16. But let's understand this. The writer of Hebrews is making a spiritual point. But you better believe the land was important to the patriarchs. And it was absolutely important to their descendants, the nation. And we can even see today some of the spiritual significance of this. And because this is my one time with you today, I, I want to try to bring in some other subjects here. But in 1967, Jerusalem was restored to Jewish control. That was the same year of the beginning of what we call the Jesus People Movement. This was the beginning of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit where hippies and radicals and rebels around the world were saved. And it reached its height in the early 1970s. That's when I was saved. The man that first invited me to Korea, Han Si Kim, was saved at that same time. He was a Marxist radical at Seoul University. He believed the only way to fulfill the teachings of Jesus was through Marxism. 
and God radically saved him. And then he started the Hansaran Campus Ministries. This was happening around the world. But do you know who was especially getting saved in the midst of this? Jewish hippies, Jewish radicals, Jewish Marxists. We were in the midst of what we call the counterculture revolution of the 60s. We were on a deep spiritual search. Most of my colleagues that were saved, uh, excuse me, most of my colleagues who are in Jewish ministry today were saved right within those few years. This will only make sense fully in English, but let me say it anyway. I wrote a track about my testimony to give to lost people. It's called From LSD to PhD. So normally it's a unique testimony. But when I was speaking at a conference with some of my Jewish friends, they had the same testimony. They had all become professors or scholars, and they all got saved out of the hippie movement as drug users. And we were all from LSD to PhD. But that Jesus People movement began in 1967. And there was a great, a great harvest of Jewish souls. It began at the same time that Jerusalem came back into Jewish control. And God gives this order of events in Ezekiel 36. It applied to the Babylonian exile, and it will apply to the return from exile at the end of the age. And it says that God will bring us back to the land in our unbelief. He will bring us back to the land when we have not yet repented. The founders of the modern state of Israel were not religious men. The early Zionist movement was, was led by atheists and communists. Many religious Jews opposed it. Years ago. God says, I will bring you back to the land. I will bring you back in your sin and your uncleanness. And there I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And that's what we're seeing in the land of Israel. More is more Israelis coming to faith in Jesus. There's a friend of mine here. He is a Gentile who has devoted himself to winning Jewish people to the Lord. Because so many Russian Jews live in Brooklyn, he learned Russian to reach out to them. This is as an Italian Gentile Christian. Don, just stand up for one second. He has been terribly grieved for many years over something. There is a world movement to pray for Jerusalem. It's wonderful. Churches are aware of the importance of praying for Jerusalem. And they pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It's about to happen again now. But there's one thing missing. Many of the churches forget to pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. You must include those prayers together. The salvation of the Jewish people and the rebuilding of Jerusalem go hand in hand. The greatest prayer is to see the Jewish people saved. And with that, there will be blessing brought to the land of Israel itself. You cannot separate the two. I have some friends who are now in their 30s. They are native-born Israelis. Their mother and father are believers in Yeshua. In Jesus. When they were kids, they were the only young people in the country that they knew who believed in Jesus. They would say to each other, what is the Messianic Jewish movement in Israel going to do today? What are the Messianic Jewish teenagers going to do today? What are the Messianic Jewish teenagers going to do today? They were talking to each other, but they were the only ones in the country. Today, you can have young people's gatherings and get 500 or 1,000 coming together. Being back in the land means spiritual restoration. So let me bring this to a close by talking about what the traditional rabbis expect to see. There's one ancient Jewish source, and it questions whether the 10 northern tribes will be regathered. And there's one viewpoint that says, no, they've been cast away forever. But that is a minority view. The overwhelming expectation is complete reuniting of all scattered Israelites. And every day of the week, traditional Jewish prayers, uh, traditional Jews pray certain prayers over and over. Traditional Jews pray three separate times every day, and they read prayers from a prayer book. And some of the prayers are repeated within the day. So over the course of a Jewish person's lifetime, they are praying these prayers thousands and thousands of times. One of the most important prayers is called the 18 benedictions. This is the 10th prayer on the list. It's the prayer for the regathering of the exile. And it says this, raise a banner to gather our dispersed and gather us from the four ends of the earth. Traditional Jews are praying this thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Fourteenth prayer is the prayer for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. 
This is what is prayed. Return in mercy to Jerusalem, your city, and dwell therein as you have promised. Speedily establish therein the throne of David, your servant, and rebuild it soon in our days as an everlasting edifice. Blessed are you, Lord, who rebuilds Jerusalem. There are promises in traditional Judaism that if you keep one of the commandments, then you will inherit the land. And there are many messianic prophecies that we know. And the traditional rabbis focus on those too. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be raised up above all the mountains. According to Jewish tradition, the miracle performed on it will be greater than the miracles on, on Mount Sinai or Mount Carmel. The scripture says that the nations will beat their swords into farming tools. The rabbis say once the nations learn the ways of God, there won't be any more war. Isaiah 11 says the wolf will lie with the lamb. Some of the rabbis say that will literally happen. Others say it speaks of the hostile nations will no longer be hostile. Isaiah 11, it speaks of God's holy mountain. And the rabbis say not just the temple, but all of the land of Israel. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 10 says, foreigners will rebuild your walls. The rabbis say that the ones who tore down your walls will now rebuild. Isaiah 62 4 says the land will be called Bu'ulah. It will be married. It will be a spouse. Who will the land be married to? To the Jews returning to the land. The rabbis say this, prophet compares the union of the land of Israel and the people of Israel to a marriage. Specifically, the marriage of a young man to a young woman. So if there are other foreigners living in the land, if they're living in the land and Israel is in exile, they're not married to the land. Foreigners could live there, but they're not married to it. As Israel returns, it's like a marriage. And then Ezekiel 40 through 48 speaks of a future temple. Christians have many different interpretations of what this would actually mean. Why will there be blood sacrifices in the future since Jesus already paid for our sins? These are good questions to ask. But Jews have no problem here. They say, yes, there'll be a future temple. And one Jewish interpretation says this. It's based on Ezekiel 43, 7. It speaks of God's throne and footstool. So the throne is the heavenly temple. The footstool is the earthly temple. Another rabbinic interpretation says this, because they will be in perfect harmony, the heavenly temple will be joined with the earthly temple. And there is a picture of paradise restored. The wolf lying with the lamb. Literally, atoms not killing each other and hurting each other anymore. Nation not rising up against each other. The earth filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. And there's some fascinating Jewish traditions about Adam before he sinned. Many imaginative Jewish traditions. So some spoke of him as being the light of the world that he would just shine. The angels would wait on him. He was so massive that he could cover the entire earth in just a few steps. And tradition says after he sinned, he was shrunk down to 150 feet. And tradition says that after he sinned, even the The heavenly stars, the lights, lost their light. So the whole world is in a fallen state. Jewish tradition says during the Messianic era, the world will be restored to the way it was before Adam's sin. It will literally be paradise restored. So I want to emphasize this again. There's a special relationship between the people of Israel and the land of Israel. I want to emphasize again that a blessed future for the people of Israel means being reestablished in the land of Israel. We both agree that it will happen through the Messiah, but the traditional Jewish community differs with us as to who the Messiah is. So I want to encourage you to do something. When you read some Jewish literature, it can be very dry. A lot of laws and traditions, endless legal discussion. And for those who didn't grow up in it, sometimes it can seem very dry. Then you pick up the Jewish prayer book, and it's filled with spiritual longing for redemption. And many times as I've read the words of the Jewish prayer book, my heart breaks. And I feel they are so near and yet so far. I encourage you to stand by them spiritually. For the religious Jews, you cannot go and pray side by side with them in the synagogues. But you can join with them in spirit. And as they are praying, oh God, regather the exiles. You are standing with them and praying. And when they are praying for the rebuilding of Jerusalem, you are standing and praying for spiritual restoration. And when they are praying for the coming of Messiah and the coming of redemption, you are saying, open their eyes to see who Messiah is. 
Some years ago, I participated in an outreach event, a Jewish outreach event in Cleveland, Ohio. It was in a big building that used to be a synagogue, but it had just been used for various events for many years now. We had a Messianic Jewish worship team with us. And the leader of the team used to go to that synagogue as a boy. And after they would play, I would speak. And there were rabbis and traditional Jews that came to the meeting. They were there in their black coats and their long beards. And they were there to watch what I was doing and to challenge me. So we had a Saturday night meeting. And towards the end of the meeting, the traditional Jews started coming in because it was after Sabbath. And then they all gathered in the front of the building. This was 1988 in October. They gathered in the front of the building. So I went out to talk to them. And they began to challenge me. We don't think you really know Hebrew. We don't think you really know what the rabbis say. So they started to challenge me. It was wonderful. And then they started lighting candles. They were having a post-Sabbath service. And there were police cars outside. They didn't know if there was going to be a demonstration or something. And they started to light the candles, and the police looked, what's, what's going on? And I just looked over at them, it's fine, it's just a religious service. And then some got in a circle and started to dance. So they said, come on, dance with us. You don't belong with them, you belong with us. So I said, of course I'll dance with you. So we get in the circle, we're holding hands. And as we're dancing, the guy to one side of me starts asking me Jewish questions. He's testing me. And God gave me supernatural energy. And one after another was dropping out. And finally, the circle stopped. And they start looking up to the sky. God, we want the Messiah. Send the Messiah. So I go right next to them. And I start shouting with them. God, show them who the Messiah is. Show them who the real Messiah is. And they start shouting. No, God, not that Messiah, the real Messiah. And I'm shouting, yes, the real Messiah, Jesus, the real Messiah. It was a remarkable event, and it was very intense emotionally. When I got back to my room, my heart was just broken for our people. But see, that's what you're doing when you're praying. You're standing right there with them, and they're saying, God, send the Messiah. And you're praying with them, yes, God, the real Messiah. Show them who he is. And I'm convinced as the prayers of the church rise, the salvation of the Jewish people will rise. So thank you for listening. Thank you for carrying this burden for the Jewish people through these years. And may the Lord privilege us to see the salvation of the Jewish people in our generation. Amen. Thank you.